over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to spend time talking a little bit about Cystic, the company, and a little bit about the problem that we're setting out to solve. I will then hand this to Loris and Pyle, who will dig deeper into the technology stack and into the products we bring to bear and the problems we solve in more detail. Now, let me just start by saying, Cystic got started because of Loris, uh, our founder, and his love for network packets. Loris was co-creator of the open source project Wireshark, which um, has, is one of the wi most widely deployed network analyzers in the open source community. And when the company that Loris started was acquired by Riverbed, we started by asking a question, he started by asking a question that in many ways was the genesis of the company. And the question was quite simply, as more and more applications go on to the cloud, and it's impossible to tap into network data, and as people start building applications as services within containers, how do I get access to the data that allows me to monitor, troubleshoot, and secure applications? And that sort of in many ways spawned the company. In, in the last five to six years since we've been in the marketplace, we've become larger as a company. We are now over 200 employees from the one person that started it all. We have hundreds of large enterprises that are deploying us, but in many ways our mission to this day remains very much the same, which is how do we enable enterprises that are deploying cloud applications to securely and reliably run those applications. And so very quickly, as I take a snapshot of where we are today, um, the company's model is, a, is an open core model. The open source projects that we started with that spawned Sysdig, uh, specifically the Sysdig open source project and Falco, are very much a key part of our commercial offering. They are the heart of what we do. But in addition, there are other key open source projects, Prometheus, Kubernetes itself, Ancore, that are all sort of building blocks for our commercial platform. And, and so very much of an open core model is how we go to market. I've already said this, but a, a really sort of core part of who we serve, the customer base that we address today, is large enterprises. In particular, we have hundreds of enterprises within our customer base. But among those are dozens of Fortune 1000 companies, some really large government organizations, um, and some large cloud companies as well. And given sort of our focus on Kubernetes and containers, we've invested quite heavily in partnerships with key companies that really are sort of driving the Kubernetes ecosystem, the cloud companies in particular, Red Hat and others in that community. And, and so as I step back and look at sort of how far we've come, We've grown our customer base, we've built a strong community, and we are very proud of the momentum that we're seeing. I, I recognize that for most of our customers, it's just the very beginnings of containerization, the very beginnings of Kubernetes adoption. And for us, it's, a, it's sort of very early stage as well, but already much of the adoption we're seeing and sort of much of the brand we're building, we're very proud of what we've done to date. So let me transition now, though, a little bit to look at what problem are we solving uh, for our customers? And, and sort of when I think about um, who we serve today, as I mentioned, it's companies that have already made the jump towards cloud native applications as the architecture with which they're approaching software development. Highly distributed sort of containerized applications is, is how most of our customers are starting to move their software development towards. And, and for good reason, the business benefits are very significant. I won't belabor this too much. Faster application development, more cost-effective development, and actually even lower risk because you can scale up and scale down your infrastructure depending on the success of your applications. Perhaps even more significantly for developers, this journey towards containerized microservices is also a really, really big boon. For them, for the first time, they're freed from making choices about programming languages. In some ways, they're freed from having to worry about interoperability. And, and so the adoption in most of our customer bases, once they start down this journey, even though it's early days, the direction is very much set. It feels like sort of bright days when they move towards containerized microservices as the architecture for applications. And yet, when you think about how do I translate this into operational reality, for DevOps teams that are supposed to maintain the platform that these developers are using, for security teams, the move towards containers and Kubernetes and microservices presents an ever-growing problem. More specifically, sort of for them, the existing tooling falls way short of what they need to do as more and more applications move on to cloud-native building blocks. 
whether it's firewalls that no longer have visibility into network traffic, whether it's intrusion detection systems that can no longer understand what's happening within containers, whether it's traditional APM tools that basically cannot instrument every app running on every container, suddenly you feel a loss of visibility into what's taking place within your infrastructure. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk in depth about one customer example to illustrate sort of what they want by way of operational visibility and contrast that with the challenge that they face. So this is a customer that's one of the largest banks globally. This is a customer that after two years of deep engagement and evaluation has deployed Sysdig. And this is a customer that has thousands of developers. They are building thousands of applications um, and services. They have over 100,000 host environment and they have decided to move quite aggressively towards containerization over the last several years. They um, started down this journey even before Docker was prevalent, so they have their own container runtime, and over time they're moving more and more towards this model of development where much of, much of their applications are running as services on a very large amount of infrastructure. If you think about what's in their infrastructure given this background, at any given point in time, there are thousands of services running on all of the hosts. Some of those hosts are on AWS, some of them are on Google, some of, them, some of them are on their own data centers. And so the challenge for them is, how do I even know what is running when I take a look across my entire infrastructure? And so let me just go a bit, dig a bit deeper. Let me start by saying when we engage with them, the example I'm gonna walk through is one of about 20 different use cases or challenges that they wanted to address as they move towards containerization in a, in, a, in a very significant way. So I'm gonna dig deeper into one of their specific problems um, and we sort of internally we term it as application fingerprinting, but here are the set of questions that they're trying to understand. How do I first, at any given point in time, discover in real time what applications and what services are running across my entire infrastructure? I can no longer rely on application teams provisioning servers, provisioning software, and then having a central CMDB maintain an inventory of what's being deployed on my infrastructure. I can basically deploy services I need to. How do I know what's running everywhere? Secondly, if there's a performance problem on any of my services, what I really wanna understand is what's the behavior of upstream services and what's the behavior of downstream services. If there's any one particular service experiencing some amount of degradation, how do I know what's happening upstream of that service and downstream of that service? So I almost need to understand sort of how these services are linked to each other. Now this is a company that's deployed a very significant APM solution and they, for years they've been deploying APM in the bank. But the challenge of instrumenting every service and every developer's code with APM is such that the coverage is still around 10% or so, or so of their services are basically instrumented with APM metrics that they can trace a transaction through. For most of the other services that are running, they don't have a, they don't have a way of tracking every service and what it's talking to. An even more interesting problem comes in when the security team gets involved. What they wanted was a way to say, for every service that's running, thousands of services real time, for every service that's running, I want to understand the network connections that that service is making to every other service within my infrastructure, so that if there are unauthorized connections between services, I have a way of getting notified that there's a potential security violation that's taking place. And lastly, if they ever were to discover a breach in a particular application, how do they translate that application to the underlying services, to the underlying containers, when that container itself has disappeared a few days ago and there's no trace of what that container did, right? And so this whole process of service mapping and understanding what the services are doing is just one of a uh, almost 20 use cases that we were, we were addressing with the bank. And so in a, if, I, if I step back and describe what is it that this customer wants to have happen, what kind of visibility do they want, Really what they're looking for, and there are many, many teams within the bank depending on, on, this, uh, on solving the same problem. Central monitoring teams, teams that are doing capacity planning, forensic teams that are responsible for responding to um, breach detection, as well as security teams that are responsible for compliance and auditing sort of um, access, if you will. What they want is a map, a map that basically discovers in real time every single application maps the network connections between every application and every other application that's running on their infrastructure, and has a core set of metrics as telemetry that's available for every application 
and the network connections between that application and every other application. So that's really what they want, but they want to get there without having to extensively instrument every application, which is simply not practical when they're moving so quickly in a containerized sort of service-oriented application development model. That, in a nutshell, is the visibility challenge that this bank faced. And if I were to just abstract from this into what we hear across our customer base, I'll give you some more examples. This is a large utility company in Europe, and very interesting. It's a very simple problem. Um, at another level, it becomes very complex when you're dealing with containers and microservices that are highly ephemeral in nature. They have capacity planning tools that they've deployed. Their challenge is as they move from static virtualized infrastructure to dynamic containerized infrastructure, they don't know how to track the capacity that each application consumes in terms of physical resources. Their capacity planning tools are falling way short. When you think this is another customer that says our entire monitoring depended for security as well as for troubleshooting, depended on polling everything every 60 seconds. When entire containers can come and go in a span of seconds and leave no trace behind, our method of polling leaves us highly vulnerable, particularly when it comes to security breaches. Another um, customer that is a hosting company that has lots and lots of tenants, and their request um, is, is sort of, uh, this is an agency that hosts many other agencies. Their requirement is rather simple, which is any time I have a concern about any file access, I want to be able to trace the chain of custody for that file all the way through to which container running which process um, with which user um, orchestrating that process touched that file last. Right? And so simple problem, again, very hard to solve when you have a highly dynamic um, environment. Lastly, another lot of, lot of our customers are implementing scanning as a way to prevent vulnerabilities when they're deploying um, containerized applications. But what's interesting is for, for customers having knowledge of which of my images is vulnerable is one thing. Being able to map that to say, I have 150 instances of Redis, and if I have a vulnerability, what I want to really know is how many of them are in my extremely sensitive e-commerce app versus how many of them are in my test and dev instance in AWS West and so on. So having a topological view, a logical view, not just a physical view of vulnerabilities is extremely important. And so as I step back and abstract back I started by saying what I'm going to spend time on is describe the problem that we hear from our customers um, before, I, before we talk about the solution we bring to bear. In a nutshell, we think of this problem as being entirely about how do I get deep visibility when, I go, when I'm going down the path of building cloud-native applications, how do I have deep visibility in order to address monitoring problems, troubleshooting problems, security problems, forensics, needs, et cetera. And that really is the problem that we as a company are setting out to solve, the problem being terms of the cloud native visibility gap. And, and really, it comes down to if I, as a DevOps team, if I, as a security team, um, have the charter of building um, and maintaining my infrastructure, how do I make sure that before images are deployed, they are free of vulnerabilities, and that my developers are following best practices in, in how they're building apps? During runtime, how do I have a good understanding of what performance disruptions are taking place, what health disruptions are taking place, what risks am I encountering from a security perspective, and how do I detect in real time sort of what risks I'm facing. And then when I do um, run into a breach, when I do run into a performance problem, how do I rapidly diagnose why it's happening and shorten the time to resolution of those problems? That, in a nutshell, is really what Sysdic's mission in life is. How do we address these problems and bring deep visibility as people move towards cloud-native apps very quickly, and you'll hear a lot more, in response to that problem is, is really sort of what we, uh, our platform, the Cloud Native Visibility and Security platform, is all about addressing this Cloud Native Visibility gap that I talked about. We think of it not as a monitoring product or a security product or a troubleshooting product. We think of it as a data platform that has deep insights into what's going on in your infrastructure and within your applications. And those insights help you address monitoring needs, address troubleshooting needs, compliance needs, forensics needs, vulnerability management needs, and so on. So we think of these as workflows, but the core strength of what Sysdig does is we've built a data platform that addresses all of these various needs. And in a nutshell, if you were to measure our success, and these are sort of anecdotally built up from many of our customer deployments, it's about how can I make my journey to its cloud-native applications go faster, 
It's how do I make sure that my DevOps team and security team is much more eff efficient in managing this infrastructure? And lastly, how do I radically shrink the risk posture as I'm deploying more and more production apps and cloud native infrastructures? So that in a nutshell is sort of the company introduction to what we do as a company, an introduction to the problem. At this point, let me just pause and before I hand off to Loris, any questions, comments? This was meant to be an introduction to sort of what we do, please. Yes, I have a question. Um, do we have to use uh, your product uh, with Istio or instead Istio? Great question. So there's a two-part answer. One of the things that we do um, really well, um, let me step back by saying, when you think about what is Istio, Istio is many things. And so let me start by saying, if you're deploying a large um, sort of set of services on containers, Istio in many ways is a controller that allows you to deploy a service mesh. The service mesh could be used to offload load balancing decisions from developers. Um, the service mesh could be used to enforce security policies. It also allows you to extract metrics about sort of service to service latency, for example. So it's a, it's, it solves many problems and in that sense, it's also a very large uh, footprint for all that it's trying to accomplish, right? So with that as context, some of the things that we already do extremely well in our platform, and we'll get into this in more detail as we go along, but the short answer, we are already, by, um, by the strength of the instrumentation we built into our platform, we're able to extract um, often what's termed golden signals. So what is my service to service latency when I'm communicating from service A to service B? That's something that we extract even in the absence of Istio. Istio allows us to do that in a more systematic manner with more sort of rich information, if you will. In a similar vein, when we are thinking about enforcing policies around tell me what services are talking to what other services so I can do things like blacklisting, whitelisting, et cetera, we extract that through knowledge of what network connections are being made between services. Istio, of course, gives us sort of a much richer set of information. So to some degree, the way I would answer that is we solve many of the problems, but we are not a replacement for Istio. If anything, Istio being available strengthens our ability to solve those problems better. Does that okay. yeah, make sense? Thanks.